Hello and welcome to this, the first episode of A Word from the Wise. Today I'm joined by Dr. Kurt Sylvan and we're going to be discussing epistemology. Now this series is going to consist of four episodes regarding the A-level syllabus of epistemology. So for those studying, this topic is going to be concerning 3.1.1, epistemology, what is knowledge? So Kurt's going to be talking us through the distinction between different kinds of knowledge that we normally have, and then the nature of definition and how we use it. And then he's going to go to, on to talk about the tripartite view, as it's described in the syllabus, or the JTB understanding of knowledge as it's more commonly known. And he's going to talk us through how it works, some of the criticisms and concerns, and then he's going to explain some of his own intuitions and opinions on the syllabus and the content that it holds. Okay, so what we're going to begin with is just a brief discussion of um, the main thing that's discussed in epistemology, which is knowledge. So we need to be clear on what it is that we're talking about uh, in epistemology when we talk about knowledge. So there are importantly different things that people in ordinary language could use the term knowledge to refer to you. And it is pretty common to draw a threefold distinction um, mentioned in the A-level syllabus between acquaintance knowledge, ability knowledge, and propositional knowledge. Yeah, between um, acquaintance knowledge, ability knowledge, and propositional knowledge, where the main focus of the literature and epistemology is on propositional knowledge. Uh, for reasons that I'll explain later, this distinction is a vexed one and there's actually quite a bit of recent literature about ability knowledge, so that's now become an important topic in epistemology. And arguably as well, acquaintance knowledge was historically a quite central topic in epistemology. But when you think about uh, contemporary epistemology starting, say, in the 60s going up to the um, early 2000s, the main focus was on propositional knowledge. So what's that? Uh, it's just the kind of knowledge that we have in mind when we make claims of the form uh, a person S, epistemologists like to use that letter, uh, knows that P, where you can fill in P with um, a sentence like the Battle of Hastings was fought in 1066. Um, so that's clearly an important thing that we do have in mind often when we talk about knowledge and a lot of the knowledge that a person acquires is knowledge um, of the truth of propositions. It's worth saying that it's not entirely clear that we should use the term propositional knowledge without at least defending that way of thinking about what we're doing when we use expressions of the form. A person S knows that P. So when we say things like Jones knows that the Battle of Hastings was fought in 1066, it is tempting to think that what's going on there is that a person is related to this thing that people in philosophy of language talk about, a proposition, which is the meaning of a declarative sentence. Um, but some epistemologists, historically at least, would have thought that knowledge is something a bit more direct. So knowledge is in the first instance, knowledge of a fact, where a fact is understood as something concrete in the world. So what you know is something real that's out there in the world. And this kind of goes back to a basic idea that Plato had had at the outset in some of the earliest discussions of epistemology and Western philosophy of thinking that knowledge is fundamentally a relation between us and reality. So to have knowledge is to have knowledge of what's real. And there's a dispute if you end up looking at metaphysics and philosophy of language about what these things, propositions are. Some people think of them as abstract objects that are kind of sitting up in platonic heaven. And when you know them, what you know is that those things are true, that they correspond to a state of affairs in reality. 
historically not everyone would have wanted to think that knowledge is fundamentally first a relation between us and a proposition which happens to represent the world accurately. They would have thought, no, actually knowledge gets directly at the world. What it is to know is to be in contact with reality, uh, to confront reality <laughs> as it is in itself. And arguably that kind of idea is lost if we think of what we're related to in the first instance as a proposition, the meaning of a sentence. Because then it seems like what you know in the first instance is something kind of more tied up with language and meaning than it is really tied up with the world. Still, it has become very common to just refer to knowing that P as propositional knowledge, even though you could think once you filled in P that what's known is a fact, not just a proposition that's true. Um, so that's, that's worth clarifying. So that's what propositional knowledge is. There are other things that we can use the language of knowledge to refer to. Um, one kind of thing that we often talk about is uh, knowing how to do things. Um, so the A-level syllabus refers to this as ability knowledge. And it is true that when you know how to do something, um, there's some important connection between that state that you're in and having certain abilities. So you might think, look, to really know how to ride a bike requires having certain abilities. Again, I did want to say that even here matters are more complicated and that in recent literature and epistemology, people have questioned whether knowing how is just the same thing as having an ability. And you can see why people would be suspicious about this if you think about some simple kinds of examples. So imagine a very skilled pianist whose hands are cut off. We want to say that that pianist still knows how to play the piano, but they aren't able to play it anymore, um, at least until they get prosthetic hands. Um, so if you think about that kind of case, it's really not clear that simply in virtue of knowing how to do something, you also have the ability to do it. It seems like maybe we can separate those things. Um, and so that makes it a bit tricky to say that when we talk about knowing how, what we're talking about is an ability. Though many people would say that if you know how to do something and you have the right kinds of resources, so you do have hands, then you have the, the ability to do it. So we put the hands back on the pianist um, and the pianist then couldn't play the piano. We would then question whether he still knew how to play the piano. Um, so there's still some kind of connection with ability, but it's not as direct as you might initially have thought if you think about that kind of example. A final thing that one can talk about in thinking about knowledge is what the A-level syllabus calls acquaintance knowledge. There are really two kinds of things that could be meant by this. Um, in the paper by Zagzebski that's mentioned in the A-level syllabus, she has one kind of thing in mind, but you might encounter this term elsewhere referring to something different. So sometimes when people talk about acquaintance knowledge, they're talking about the kind of knowledge that in many languages other than English is referred to by a different verb. Um, so um, I don't speak French and so I'm going to mispronounce these words unfortunately, but in French there's a difference between savoir and connaître. I don't, don't think I'm saying that right. Um, but the second thing refers to a kind of knowing, it's knowing people um, or places. Um, so that's one kind of thing that one might have in mind when one talks about one's acquaintances. Obviously, one has in mind people that one knows in that sense. So that's one thing that you could have in mind. What Zagzebski, though, in this paper has in mind is knowledge that is obtained by means of a relation of acquaintance, where paradigm examples of such a relation would include introspective awareness of one's mental states, like being aware that one is in pain, and perceptual awareness of the world. Um, 
again, there's a vexed question here, though, about whether this is a different kind of thing from um, knowing that uh, a proposition is true or knowing a truth or knowing part of reality. So again, going back in the history of philosophy, Plato um, actually had defended a kind of view about um, knowledge of truth according to which it amounts to a kind of intellectual perception of truth through one's grasp of the forms. So Plato actually had a distinctive kind of account of knowledge which is mainly developed in the Republic um, on which knowledge that uh, a certain truth is true amounts to being acquainted with that truth through one's intellect. And so it's not actually so obvious that we should say that there are two different things here. Moreover, if, what, if all that we mean is knowledge by acquaintance, it could be that the knowledge we have in mind is propositional knowledge. It's just propositional knowledge that's gained via perception or via introspective awareness. And if that's right, what we mean by using the term knowledge there is also propositional knowledge. It's just a kind that's acquired in a certain way, um, which would make it different from knowledge you acquire by testimony, for example. Um, so those are the distinctions. In epistemology, people are mainly interested in talking about propositional knowledge in a lot of the literature that you would be reading um, and that you have presumably been learning. Okay, so then what is epistemology about? Um, what, what are epistemologists really trying to do? Well, they're interested in this question of what knowledge is, but there are different ways of thinking about what that question is asking. Um, and here I will draw a distinction that Zagzebski also draws between two ways of thinking about um, the project of answering this question. So, especially in epistemology between the 60s and the early 2000s, people thought of the task of epistemology as fundamentally the task of giving a definition of knowledge. Um, but there are different ways that you can think about what a definition is. So you could think of definitions here as referring to definitions of a word, in which case the main project of epistemology would be a kind of semantic project of saying what the meaning of the word knowledge is. That's actually not really what epistemologists had in mind um, after the 70s or so, um, because linguistic philosophy started to uh, give way to a metaphysical turn in philosophy around the 70s when philosophers like David Armstrong and David Lewis started to revive traditional metaphysics. Um, there, of course, had been this long period from the very beginning of analytic philosophy to the 50s or so of thinking about philosophy as really being about language. And when people talked about knowledge in those years, they did have in mind uh, theorizing about the word um, and about the meaning of that word. But there was this important shift that happened in the 70s. Um, and so when you read people like Alvin Goldman, for example, um, writing in 1967, um, the causal theory of knowledge, and then in the 70s, um, what is justified belief and some other papers where he talked about justified belief and knowledge. He was primarily interested in um, knowledge as a real thing, not the word. Um, it's not to say that he doesn't care at all about the language, but what he really wanted to look at was um, what uh, used to be called a real definition. So Locke had distinguished between nominal definitions and real definitions. Real definitions belong to metaphysics, where we try to break a real thing down into its component parts and say how it's built up out of those parts. And that's different from a nominal definition, which is just a semantic analysis of, of word. Um, so 
from the 70s onward, there was this shift toward thinking about the basic question of epistemology as really being a metaphysical question about the nature of this relation, the relation of knowing uh, that so-and-so is the case. Um, and you'll see something like this distinction in Zagzebski's paper. It is worth noting that in addition to this distinction between answering the question, what is knowledge, in a way that looks at language, and answering it in a way that looks at reality, there's a third thing you could do, which is look at the concept of knowledge. And there actually was still some kind of turf warfare in philosophy in the 70s going into the 80s about whether when we try to do metaphysics, we first look at concepts and only thereby learn about the nature of reality or whether we can kind of directly go to reality and just say things about it. Um, so although linguistic philosophy had started to die out in the 50s and then really was kind of deceased by the 70s, conceptual analysis, this practice of analyzing concepts, wasn't something that everyone would have agreed went away. And so some people that you might read from around that period would have said that they were talking about the concept of knowledge. Um, and that's something which is kind of in between thinking about the real thing and just thinking about a word because a concept is a kind of mental representation um, which might be shared by people who use different languages. Um, still though, it had been thought by some people and is still thought by many philosophers today that there's a kind of important connection between conceptual analysis and metaphysics. Many people think, yeah, we philosophers sit in our armchair, we don't look at the world, and so what we're doing is just thinking. And if that's right, we can't really be claim, claiming <laughs> to, to be doing an investigation of reality in the same sense that physicists have in mind. So it, it does seem perhaps like in the first instance we look at concepts, but there's this hope that by doing that, we actually do learn something about reality. And that relies on this optimistic assumption that there is some kind of correspondence between the structure of concepts and the structure of, of reality. Um, but then in, in later epistemology, there is much more disagreement about, about which is the fundamental project. And some people like Hilary Kornblith actually went and said, no, I am really doing the same thing that scientists are doing. I'm doing cognitive science and thinking about what knowledge is. I'm not thinking about concepts at all. Um, I'm thinking about this psychological relation that we bear to the world. Um, so anyway, so those are three, three things that one might have in mind in thinking about um, what's being sought when we ask the question, what is knowledge? Okay, so now we're going to actually look at what epistemologists tried to do to answer this question, what is knowledge, um, beginning in, say, the mid-20th century. So um, in this classic 1963 paper by Edmund Gettier, it was claimed that there was a standard account of knowledge that people had been accepting for the last little while and Gettier even speculated that this had been going on much longer. Um, in particular, he suggested that there was this standard account of knowledge which sought to analyze it into three components, justification, truth, and belief. So this is the tripartite account of knowledge, as it's sometimes called. It's really more commonly called the JTB account. And what this account proposes is that um, when you know something that consists in your having a certain belief that a proposition is true, that belief being true, and you're having a good reason um, or justification to think that it's true. Um, so that was 
the account that people then started to worry about, starting with this paper by Gettier. It is worth noting that although a lot of people agreed or accepted Gettier's historical claim that this was the standard account, it's not actually clear that that's true um, in any very interesting way. So at the beginning of Gettier's paper, he cites a couple of people, Ayer and, and Chisholm, who offer accounts that do have three parts. And the three parts look something like justification, truth, and belief, though actually both of them use different language. Um, so um, instead of talking about belief, um, one of them had talked about acceptance. And instead of talking about justification, Ayer talked about the right to believe and um, Chisholm talked about having good evidence. But yeah, I mean, f at least for those two philosophers, it's pretty compelling to think that they had something like this tripartite account in mind. But if you go back much before that, it's really not clear that this was the standard account, um, or indeed was a very popular account throughout the history of epistemology. So Gettier in this paper speculates that Plato held this view, but this is just mistaken um, if you actually read enough Plato. So one reason why you might think this is true is because in the dialogue the Theotetus, it's the last view that they talk about, which makes it seem maybe like they think it's the most promising view, Socrates and Theotetus. But no, at the end of the dialogue, they conclude that it's false. <laughs> so they don't accept the view. Um, and one might infer that Plato, for that reason, doesn't really think it is the right view. There's another place where Plato says something that sounds a bit like the JTB account in the Mino, but this is really just a kind of offhand remark. There, Plato is mainly interested in the value of knowledge, why knowledge is a good thing, rather than in the nature of knowledge. Um, and the most that he says there is just that whenever you have knowledge, you have an account of why a certain truth is the truth. And Gettier, I think, was thinking, well, that's kind of like the justified true belief account, because what is it to have an account of some truth? Well, it's to think that something is true and to be able to give an, a, give an account of its truth. And you might think of that as kind of giving a justification for thinking that, that it's true. But Plato does not say in that dialogue that that's what knowledge is. He just says, whenever you know, you have that. And that leaves open this metaphysical question about which is more fundamental. And if you then read the Republic, Plato accepts this other view I had mentioned earlier, according to which what it is to know that something is true is to intellectually perceive uh, a fact and he thinks that that gives you a possession of why um, the truth is true because he thinks for you to be able to have that kind of grasp of a fact you have to grasp the constituents of that fact which include forms um, or the constituents of that truth which, which include the forms and when you know the forms, you do know the nature of something. You know a kind of account of what it is for that thing to be a thing of that kind. But that's that's the only reason why in the Mino he then says, um, when you know you have possession of an account of the truth. Um, you do have that, but it's because you perceive the truth in a, this distinctive way that involves grasping forms. Um, and if you then look at the history of philosophy, actually a lot of people seem to have continued to accept something in that vein. Um, a lot of people treated knowledge as intellectual perception of truth, and then they had different kinds of views about what that involves. Rationalists thought of that as not really being kind of like sensory perception, but instead as intuition or something like that. And empiricists would then want to say, well, actually it just kind of is perception. Um, and so Locke, for example, explicitly accepts this kind of view, but by perception of the truth, he, he means sensory perception. 
Um, so anyway, it's not clear that people really did accept the JTB view, but since many epistemologists at the time were were not very well versed in, in the history of philosophy, a sad thing to, having to do with specialization in philosophy, no one questioned this, and then everyone came to believe that this was the standard view, which is just kind of silly. Um, in any case, though, that did end up shaping the next 50 years of discussion. And um, many people thought that even though the JTB account isn't strictly speaking true for reasons that we'll discuss later, having to do with the problem Gedier had posed in this paper, nonetheless, something kind of close to it might be true. Still, though, in the early literature in epistemology, there were a few people who had questioned whether each of the conditions that are claimed to be necessary for knowledge are in fact necessary. So there had been a bit of debate about whether we should even think um, justification is required or whether we should think belief is required for knowledge, especially of those two things. But none of that really set in and um, it does kind of seem like an accurate read of the trajectory of epistemology that most people did basically accept the necessity of these three conditions. So it's worth talking about some reasons why you might question the necessity of these conditions. Here I'll talk mostly about the belief condition and the justification condition rather than the truth condition, but I will say a little bit about that. So nearly all epistemologists do think that to know the truth of a proposition, it has to be true. Um, that just seems like a trivial claim. Still, some people did have pointed out that um, there are some cases in which we can use the language of propositional knowledge, even though we're not talking about knowledge of something that really is true. Um, but it's often thought that these examples are uh, non-literal or involve confusion um, of some kind. So sometimes, for example, a person might say, oh, I just really did know that this was going to happen, but then it didn't happen. And that might seem to imply that it's possible to have known something without it being true. But that, to me, does feel like a strain on the language. To me, it feels like what you're saying there is either you felt like you knew it, but you simply didn't, um, or you're meaning to kind of really put an emphasis on this high degree of confidence that you had. You felt certain, say, that it was the case, and then it turned out not to be the case. And either of those ways of interpreting the language would not involve literally thinking that you can know something that's false. And so it just seems like there's not a very good reason to reject the truth condition. Some people, though, who think about epistemology as being about language have questioned whether um, it's a semantic truth that the sentence, sentences of the form S knows that P entail that P is true. And um, there is this paper by Alan Hazlitt called The Myth of Factive Verbs in which he tries to question that claim. But that's very heretical stuff. Um, so no one really buys that except him and maybe a few, a few other people. So most people accept that condition. The belief and justification conditions are more interesting. There's much more serious reason to be a bit worried about these. So I'll first talk about the belief condition. Around shortly after Gettier's paper was published, there was a paper published by um, Colin Radford in which he tried to question the belief condition on the basis of some examples that to me do seem like pretty concerning examples. Um, so here's the kind of example that he had in mind. Um, Imagine that uh, you're a very conscientious student who has really studied thoroughly for this exam, but you don't have enough self-confidence. And so when you enter 
the exam, you cease to feel like you really know the answers to the questions. Imagine, though, that you try to answer them to the best of your ability. You don't feel like you do know, and you get all of them right, and that's due to your actually having memory of, of these facts that you were asked to memorize. It seems like we want to say you did know those answers. Um, you just didn't feel like you knew. And it also really does seem like we want to say that given that you lost your self-confidence in the exam conditions, that you cease to be confident of the truth of those claims. And if that's true, then it seems like maybe you can know something without believing it, because belief does seem to be connected to confidence. It's hard to see how you could believe something to be true without having confidence that it's true. And so if you can know something without having confidence that it's true, it looks like maybe then you can know something without believing it to be true. So I think those are pretty interesting examples. What is clear is that you can't know that something is true without having some mental representation of its truth. It's just bizarre to think that you could know a fact without there being any kind of thing in your head that represents that fact as being true. But I do think there's an interesting question about what that mental representation is and that people are probably too quick to assume that it's belief. Um, I mean, one thing that seems clear in the Radford example is that you continue to remember the truth of these facts, although you're not aware that that's what you're doing. Um, that clearly does still involve a mental representation, although it's not one that's conscious because you don't feel that that's what you're doing, remembering, uh, remembering the facts. But if that is what you're doing, then you have a memory representation of those facts so that does suggest that when you know that something is true, you always do have to have a mental representation, but perhaps we should think in some cases you can have a memory representation without believing that it's accurate. And I think that that's actually a pretty plausible thing to say. That's not, though, what people ended up thinking about the Radford example. So a lot of people reacted to this example by saying that there are just two different kinds of belief. There's kind of conscious, explicit belief, and then there's implicit or unconscious belief, some distinction like that. And they would then say, well, maybe you did continue to believe that these answers were true implicitly or at some level, even if at a different level you didn't. And if that were the right thing to say, the knowledge still would imply belief. It would just imply a specific kind of belief or imply either explicit belief or implicit belief. And for some reason, that's what a lot of people seem to think is the real lesson of those examples. I'm odd, though. I don't think that's the right thing to say. And I, to me, it seems obvious. Um, so I think people have been not nice enough to Radford. I think, I think he showed something important. Still, the belief condition is really not very widely questioned um, for the reason I just explained. The justification condition is more widely questioned, um, although it depends a bit on how we're understanding uh, the claim that this condition is necessary for knowledge. If all that we mean by that is that knowledge entails justification, then most people would agree that that's true. Whether it's true that knowledge has justified belief as a part is not so obviously true for reasons associated with some theories of knowledge we'll talk about later, namely reliabilism and virtue epistemology. Um, first, though, it is worth saying something about the history of, um, of this discussion, because there was a brief period, about 10 years or so, when a lot of people, or a kind of important sect of philosophers at least, we're pretty convinced that knowledge doesn't entail justified belief. So starting with papers by um, David Armstrong and Elvin Goldman in the 60s, people started to entertain the idea of accepting a causal account of knowledge, according to which when you know that something is true, you have a belief that it's true, which is caused by the fact that it's true. And what, then pe what people then begin to think is that maybe 
there can be cases in which you're caused to believe the truth by the truth, even though you don't understand how that's working and hence don't really have reason to think that um, what you believe is the truth. And um, there are various examples that are brought up in this connection. One favorite example among epistemologists is the example of the chicken sexer. Um, it's, it's probably fictional, but uh, it was at least thought that there are people who have this ability um, to sort chicks between male and female um, despite the fact that when they do it, they don't know how they're doing it and they don't feel like there's anything that they could point to as the reason why they're, they're sorting it, uh, sorting the chicks in this way. Many people would want to say that when the chicken sexer does sort the chicks, um, they do so in a way that manifests knowledge of the sex of the chick. They do know that it's male or know that it's female. But they don't have reason to think that that's true. They just had this ability to recognize the, the sex of the chick. Um, so this example of the chicken sexer was thought by some to be a good evidence for the causal account of knowledge because you can uh, pick up on the fact that the chick is male or female in virtue of subconsciously uh, sensing a certain distinctive feature that distinguishes male or female chicks, even though you don't have reason to think that that's what you're doing. So you could think of that as a case in which there's a certain feature that's causing you to think that it's male or causing you to think that it's female, which is in fact a reliable indicator of um, the sex of the, of the chick and that that's why you're able to know. Um, and for a period from about the kind of mid 60s to the mid 70s, it became fairly popular to think that this is a case where you can know that something is true even though you don't have a justification for thinking that it's true. Um, but there was then a shift shortly after that um, toward the end of the 70s, um, especially led by Alvin Goldman in which people drew a different lesson from these kinds of examples. Um, instead of taking them to show that you can know without having justification, they took them to show that justification is something that you can have even if you don't have reasons. Um, so Goldman thought we should distinguish in this 1979 paper what is justified belief between the status that a belief has when it's justified and the activity of giving justifications. Sure, it does seem like when we think of the activity of ju giving justifications, what one is doing is giving reasons. Um, and that makes um, it quite plausible to think um, on the face of it that, um, that if you accept the JTB view, you're going to run into trouble with the chicken sexer case. But if you think that a belief can have the status of justification in virtue of being produced just by a reliable process or just in virtue of being caused in the right way by a fact, then you could still think in this case that the chicken sexer's belief is justified even though they didn't engage in an activity of justifying and even though they don't have a reason to think that it's true. So um, that distinction between a belief having the status of being justified, being permissible, being something that's okay for you to believe, and the belief being something that's produced by a process of reasoning or a process of justification does seem like an important distinction. And once you draw it, it then does become quite compelling to think that, well, yeah, maybe the chicken sexer does think that it's male and it's okay for them to think that. They have a right to think that that's true because their belief was caused in this good way. But if that's true, then their belief is justified. It's just they don't have a kind of separate justification for thinking that it's true. And that kind of maneuver ended up being very popular. And after Goldman's 1979 paper, most people just did end up agreeing that, um, that um, knowledge entails justification. Um, there has been 
a shift beginning in the 2000s and continuing to the present day of people questioning what this entailment really shows. So even if you think that knowledge entails justification, you might think it's wrong to say that it's explained in terms of justification. And there are two kinds of things that you could do at this stage. One kind of thing that you could do is to say, in the case of the chicken sexer, the chicken sexer first comes to have knowledge, and that's why they're justified in believing what they believe. If you accept that kind of account, you think knowledge is really grounded in being produced, uh, beliefs being produced by the truth, um, where that doesn't involve justification. And then after that, that causes you to have justification. Um, that's a quite different thing that you could say. And if you thought that, you shouldn't think we should analyze or define knowledge in terms of justification. You should merely think that knowledge entails justification because it gives you justification in this kind of case. So that was a view that was uh, proposed by Timothy Williamson. He agreed that knowledge entails justification, but he thought the explanation runs from knowledge to justification rather than the other way around. Um, and he created a kind of movement of people who now uh, believe something like this, the knowledge first movement, where many people have thought, well, actually, maybe we should stop trying to define knowledge. We should use it to define other things. And maybe we could use it to define justification. Um, and I myself accept a view that's kind of similar in spirit to this. So I think knowledge is not defined in terms of justification, though unlike Williamson, I um, don't think that knowledge can't be analyzed at all. So I actually think something like Goldman's old causal account of knowledge is a pretty good account. It's not quite the right account, but it's pretty close to the truth. If that's right, we can define knowledge in more basic terms, in terms of belief, truth, and causation. Um, but we don't define it in terms of justification. And when we accept this kind of account, we can then do the same thing that Williamson wants to do, which is to then define justification in terms of knowledge. Um, so the kind of account that I accept is one according to which knowledge is just this very primitive mental state, which involves having a mental representation that's caused by the truth. And when you're in this mental state, you then have access to certain facts and you can use those facts then as reasons to believe things, which then give you justification. So knowledge is kind of the way that you enter the space of reasons, according to my account. Uh, the most basic kinds of knowledge, like perceptual knowledge, involve a kind of contact with reality that lets you grasp a fact. And then once you grasp that fact, you can use that to do justifying. Um, okay, so we had just been talking about objections to the necessity of the three conditions um, in the tripartite view. Now we'll turn to discuss a different kind of objection to the tripartite view or the JTB view, which is um, what's often called the Gettier problem. So this is a problem that was raised in Edmund Gettier's uh, 1963 paper, um, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge, um, which is meant to show that a belief can be justified and also be true, but fail to constitute knowledge because in some important sense, it's kind of only by luck that it's, that it's true. And the key lesson of the Gettier problem is just that in order to um, rule out the kind of luck that is inconsistent with knowledge, we seem to need something more than just the justification condition. Originally, we introduced the justification condition with the thought that, you know, a belief that's just a lucky guess can't amount to knowledge. And then one hopes that by adding justification, one will be able to rule out just lucky guesses. But in these kinds of cases that Gettier introduced, it seems like there's still an important sense in which the belief is only true by, by luck, or in which you only arrive at a belief that's true by luck. So what I'm going to do is mention an earlier example, and then I'll also mention one of Gettier's own examples. Uh, 
Um, so actually before um, Gettier published this paper, there had been Gettier cases produced earlier in the history of philosophy, um, but they weren't kind of produced as counterexamples to anything like the JTB account. One of the counterexamples that was produced not that long before Gettier um, does get pretty close, though, in uh, Russell's discussion. So Russell had presented this case, a stopped clock case, in which we imagine that uh, you walk into a room that you kind of regularly visit. In the past, the clock in this room has always worked. You have no particular reason to think that it shouldn't be working now. You walk into the room, look at the clock, and form the belief that it's four o'clock on the basis of the fact that that's the time that the clock s seems to say it is. Um, so your belief there seems to be justified because this clock worked in the past. You have no reason to think that it's not working now. We can also imagine that it's true um, because it is in fact four o'clock, but now add a key detail, which is that actually the clock stopped yesterday and you just happen to walk in at one of the two times during the day when a stopped clock tells the correct time. It seems like in this kind of case, you're lucky to arrive at a belief that is true and that you can't know that it's four o'clock. Nonetheless, you do have a justified true belief that it's four o'clock. And so that's a case that seems to show that having um, a justified true belief is not sufficient for having knowledge. Um, Gettier himself posed uh, cases that illustrated the same point. His cases were just a bit less imaginative than, than that case and kind of less, um, uh, less natural. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring up a more natural example first. So here is one of the kind of original Gettier cases. Um, we imagine that you have quite strong evidence to think that Brown is in Barcelona. Um, and so you initially form the belief that Brown is in Barcelona. That's a belief that's justified. Now we imagine that, you know, you've just recently taken a logic class, which you learned um, the rather silly rule of the disjunction introduction which allows you to infer from any uh, single proposition P, uh, any proposition of the form P or Q. And so um, the subject in this case decides that he's going to use the rule and he infers that either uh, Brown is in Barcelona or Brown is in Boston. That belief also seems to be justified because it was inferred from a belief that was justified using a good rule of inference. Um, and now we can also imagine that that belief is true, but it's true for a lucky reason, which is that Brown happens to be in Boston rather than Barcelona. So in this case, consider the belief um, that the subject has that uh, either Brown is in Barcelona or Brown is in Boston. That belief is justified and it's true, but it doesn't seem like we want to say it amounts to knowledge because it's just a kind of matter of luck that the subject picked a disjunct that was, that was true. Um, and a disjunction is true whenever one of the disjuncts is true. Imagine that the first one though is false. So that was one of Gettier's own examples. Um, and those examples quickly convinced epistemologists um, that the tripartite view is false, and in particular that um, we need to add a fourth condition to the tripartite view. And um, so then there was this kind of long history of people trying to tinker with the tripartite view and to add various conditions onto it, or perhaps to replace conditions with different conditions. And we'll talk about some of those analyses in a moment. One thing that is worth noting is that some people might be willing to say that um, in some of these kinds of cases, the subject isn't really justified in believing what they believe. Um, now, as I laid out the cases, I think it's somewhat difficult to accept that idea because it does seem like if you've, you know, experienced a room with this clock 
hundreds of times in the past and the clock has always worked, that that gives you very strong evidence for thinking that it should be working now because um, this clock doesn't have any kind of history of breaking down. And if you don't have any kind of counter evidence, any reason to think that in this case it's not working, it does seem like it would be plausible to say that you have good reason to think that uh, that it's four o'clock, if that's what the clock says. But there were some people at the beginning of the discussion of the Gettier problem who insisted that uh, maybe what it really shows is that justification requires more, um, and in particular that you can't really be justified in believing something that's false. Um, that, though, seems to be a quite strong view to accept, which would pronounce as unjustified many of the things that we ordinarily take ourselves to be justified in believing, because the evidence that we normally have for believing that a proposition is true is just not enough to ensure that the proposition is true. And so if one accepted this kind of view, it looks like one would have to think that only beliefs um, that you form on the basis of a deductive inference from true premises could really amount to um, justified beliefs um, or some other kind of process that guarantees truth. And, you know, few of the processes that we seem to use, perception, memory, and so on, seem to have that feature. It seems pretty clear that perception sometimes goes wrong. So the mere fact that a, a belief was um, formed by means of your faculty of visual perception doesn't guarantee that it's true. Yet, I mean, <laughs> we want to say that we know some things by perception. And so there's a kind of initial problem there for, for that proposal, which is one kind of infallibilist proposal, a kind of view on which you need to have infallible evidence in order to be justified in believing something. And so it doesn't seem like it's going to be very plausible to just replace the justification condition or to, to strengthen the justification condition um, and require that only true beliefs can really be justified. That just seems like an overly skeptical thing to say. There's a different way that you could be an infallibleist about knowledge, but not about justification. And so you could also think of an infallibleist view that doesn't involve strengthening the justification condition, but that rather involves adding, um, having an infallible basis as the fourth condition. So that kind of view would say, you can only really know that a proposition P is true. If it's true, you think that it's true, you're justified, and moreover, the justification that you have is uh, infallible. It entails truth. And that kind of view at least wouldn't lead to skeptical conclusions about justification um, because the view just doesn't involve saying that justification requires infallibility in general. Nonetheless, it would arguably have intolerably skeptical implications about, about knowledge. This kind of view would seem to rule out any kind of knowledge, however minimal, about the future, um, including um, what might seem to be pretty uncontroversial knowledge about the future, like um, my what I take to be my knowledge that the Earth will still exist in two minutes. I think that's probably true. Indeed, I think I know that that's true. I just don't see how it could be false. Nonetheless, induction is not infallible. Um, it's a process that can go wrong. And that's the only kind of basis that I have for believing something about the future. And so it looks like that different kind of infallibilism would still be overly skeptical. Not everyone's going to be persuaded by that. Some people will just think, yeah, actually, you can't really know anything about the future, even something as trivial as that. Um, but that's not a very popular kind of view in contemporary epistemology. It's widely assumed that there are at least some cases of knowledge of the future. Obviously not going to be cases where one can know very much about the distant future, but at least about the next few minutes. I mean, it seems pretty implausible to say that you can just not know anything about about that. So it doesn't look like that kind of infallibilism is very good either. Um, 
an importantly different maneuver that you can make, and this was um, another one of the first moves that people made in the liter literature responding to Gettier, is to add a different kind of uh, fourth condition specifying that the basis on which you form your belief is, is a true basis. Notice that this view does not require that the basis entails the truth of the belief that you then end up forming. It just requires that the basis itself is genuine truth. Um, and this initially seems like a pretty promising way of dealing with Gettier's own uh, examples. So remember that rather artificial example of inferring that Bran is either in Barcelona or in Boston. In that case, we're supposed to imagine that you start off with a belief that's justified but false, namely the belief that he's in Barcelona, and then use that to arrive at a belief that's true. Um, this new proposal that we're considering, one of the first that was considered, would at least correctly predict in that case that the inferred belief couldn't amount to knowledge because it's based on falsehood. And so that initially seems quite promising. But the problem is that there are other Gettier cases where it's much more controversial to say that there's been anything like an inference from a false assumption. And so for this kind of reason, this proposal, sometimes called the no false lemmas proposal that we're considering right now, didn't end up having a very long life in the literature. Although, as I'll mention in a moment, there are still some people who accept something like this view. So one question is whether this kind of view even gets the stopped clock case right. Now, in the stopped clock case, it certainly doesn't feel like if you walk in the room and just look at the clock and trust it, that you're making an inference. Um, it does feel, at least psychologically, like that case is different from the case of deliberately employing a rule like disjunction introduction to derive a further belief from some belief that you have. And so you might even have questions about whether the no false lemmas view can even account for that. Now, perhaps one thing that you could say in that kind of case is that um, you do at least have this basis of knowledge that you're drawing upon about the um, past workings of, of this clock. And it does seem crucial to build in those details um, to make it plausible to say that you are justified in believing that it's four o'clock. And so there do seem to be um, bases that your belief has in this case, even if you don't explicitly make an inference from them. Um, even if you just look at the clock and don't even think twice, just go ahead and form the belief that it's four o'clock. Those reflections might lead you to think that perhaps in that kind of case, um, it really is right to say that you're essentially relying on a false premise, which is the premise that the clock is currently working, um, which is itself something that you would need to justify on the basis of some inductive inference from your past experience. And so maybe the no false lemmas view can address that case because that case can just be treated really as a case of a belief that is justified by induction. But no one thinks that all beliefs are justified by inferences. Um, eventually, reasoning has to come to an end. And so you might then begin to worry that if we consider the most basic kinds of beliefs that a person can have, that it's going to be difficult to apply the no false lemmas view to those cases. And that was exactly what was pointed out with the example of fake barn country, um, which was made famous by Goldman, um, but he attributes it to Carl Genet in his 1975 paper, Discrimination and Perceptual Knowledge. Um, so just quickly go through the fake barns case. In this case, we imagine that um, you've just entered a uh, a part of the state, uh, say you're driving through Iowa, <laughs> um, in which 
the locals have done something a bit funny. Um, they've put up a bunch of barn facades and very convincing ones so that someone driving from some distance from these barn facades would be persuaded that they're, they're barns. And they've, they've gotten rid of most of the real barns. So most of what you, you would see if you were driving through fake barn country um, would be barn facades rather than real barns. Now imagine that you don't know anything about the existence of, of this fake barn country and you've just been driving for a long time through other parts of Iowa, say, which have real barns, and you just have no, no kind of reason to assume that uh, there's been any kind of um, uh, weird stuff going out of this, of this kind. It seems like in this case, you could look out your window as you go into fake barn country, and if you happen to see one of the few real barns that is still left in fake barn country, you could even see that there's a barn in the distance. Nonetheless, it seems like that case in which you see that there's a barn would not really be a case in which you know that there's a barn, um, because it seems that too easily you could have been um, uh, tricked by a barn facade. So that seems to be an example of a belief which is formed by means of perception, um, rather than inference, and which hence is not formed on the basis of any lemma of any kind, but which is a kind of Gettier case because it's a case in which you have a justified belief and it's true, but it doesn't amount to knowledge. So as long as two things are true, as long as first of all, this is a case of perceptual knowledge, and as long as furthermore, this is a case in which, or this is a case of perceptual belief, and as long as furthermore, this is not a case of knowledge, um, it looks like this is going to be a problem for the no false lemmas view. Now, there are some people who would be willing to say, even in this kind of case, that there's kind of an implicit assumption that you're making, which is false, which is that you're driving through um, a normal state <laughs> and a normal part of the state in which things that look like barns really are barns. So you could say that there's an assumption being made here, which is false. And some people have been willing to um, take that kind of position. So Bill Lichen, for example, in this paper, The Gettier Problem Problem, um, which is a fairly recent paper, argues that we really should take that kind of view quite seriously. And it is important to note that that kind of view doesn't really require saying that you've made an inference in the case, because you might think in a lot of cases you make assumptions even though you don't kind of really reason from those assumptions, and even though those assumptions um, cannot really be described as inputs to, to an inference. Um, still though, that kind of view would kind of require saying that there can never be kind of purely perceptual knowledge. Anything that might look like perceptual knowledge actually turns out to be some kind of disguised indirect knowledge, which depends on some assumption. And that's a quite strong claim to make. And many people would say, no, that's just not the right view about perception. Perception is just this automatic process that doesn't involve assumptions your visual system just produces certain beliefs. Um, and it's the thing that's doing the work. It's not really like you are um, doing any work at all. And so if, as long as you have that kind of conception of how um, forming beliefs on the basis of vision works, it seems like it might be pretty implausible to, to push too hard on the no false lemmas view. And so unfortunately that view doesn't seem to be very persuasive. It's not like it's obviously false, it's just it requires you to take on a lot of additional baggage. And we would like to have a solution to this problem that involves the least possible amount of further baggage. It'd be really nice if we could solve this in a way that didn't require adopting a controversial view about how perception works. It'd be nice if it just plugged into kind of any theory. Um, of, of perception, say, and gave you the right right answers. And so that's the kind of main reason why I think 
people no longer take the no-fall dilemma's view seriously. It's not that there's been a kind of knockdown argument against it, but just that to defend it, you need to accept some other views that are controversial. And so sadly, that doesn't work either. Now, so far, we've been talking about um, responses to the Gettier problem that involve keeping the justification condition and then adding a fourth condition. Um, there are other theories of that kind, but the two remaining ones on the A-level syllabus have a different kind of structure. Um, so uh, let's move on now to talk about reliabilism. Um, at least when it was formulated very early on in the late 60s and early 70s, reliabilism was just an account of knowledge and not an account of justified belief. So reliabilism about knowledge is the view that all it takes in order for you to know something is to have a true belief about that thing which is produced by a process that's reliable where reliability is just under, understood in terms of a tendency to produce beliefs that are true and a tendency not to produce beliefs that are, that are false. Um, and in the, in the early literature, reliabilists um, tended to assume that, at least in some cases, you actually don't need justification in order to know at least if we think about just about justification as consisting in reasons or something like that. And so one kind of classic uh, example um, that is brought up in favor of reliabilism is the case of the chicken sexer, which I think we had talked about before. Um, and uh, this is supposed to be a case in which a person can know that something is true even though they don't really have a reason that they could appeal to for thinking that it's true. So this involves someone who is very reliable at discriminating between male and female chicks and does this kind of professionally. They have no idea though how this skill works. And in a given case, when they form the view that a given chick is male or female, they don't feel like they could say anything more specific. That's just their kind of gut feeling about, about the case. And as it turns out, they just always happen to be right about that gut feeling. The thought in this case is supposed to be that the chicken sexer has knowledge, but not kind of in virtue of any justification that they can give, just in virtue of the skill that they have, a skill to kind of reliably discriminate between male and female chicks, even though there's kind of no thing that they could point to as the reason why they think it's a male rather than a female chick. And so that um, case was originally considered as an example of a case where you have knowledge but not justification. And hence, early versions of reliabilism um, involved getting rid of the justification condition and adding the reliability condition. Um, and now initially this might seem like something that could help with the Gettier problem because the key intuition about the Gettier problem is that in these cases where you have a belief that's justified and true but which doesn't amount to knowledge, there's a sense in which your belief is just accidentally true. But you might think, look, what is it for a belief to be formed by a reliable process? It's for it to be formed by a process that couldn't easily result in falsehood so that when you use a process that's reliable and you arrive at a belief that's true, it's no accident that you've arrived at a belief that's true. And so that might make us optimistic that perhaps this might provide a different kind of response to the Gettier problem. The problem though is that this on just a moment's further reflection doesn't really seem like much of a solution because several of the cases that we've already considered are arguably cases in which you use a reliable process. Um, so the fake Barnes case, for example, might initially seem to be a case of that kind. 
uh, visual perception, if you think of that as the process that you're using, is generally reliable. Um, and you know the limits of its reliability well enough that the kind of number of cases in which it results in falsehood is quite low. So that would kind of satisfy the definition of a reliable process. Still, in this case, we're not supposed to imagine that you really do um, know. And so that seems like a problem for, for reliabilism. Um, now, perhaps what you could try to do to respond to that is to say, well, we need to distinguish between different kind of kinds of reliability. So on the one hand, there's general reliability, reliability across environments. And then there's reliability within an environment. And perhaps you could try to say about the fake Barnes case that although perception is generally reliable, it's kind of globally reliable, it's not reliable in fake barn country. And so maybe, maybe there's a way in which you could get around that initial problem and say, well, actually in fake barn country, reliabilism about knowledge makes the right prediction. Um, the problem though is that there are going to be other cases in which it still seems to leave room for Gettier like luck. And in fact, some of the other cases that we've are already considered seem to be pretty worrying cases. So just consider Gettier's original cases, which uh, involved forming a belief on the basis of deduction. There's at least one clear sense in which deduction is an infallible process. Namely, if you uh, feed true beliefs into the process of deduction, you're always going to get true beliefs out as a result. So there's a sense in which deduction is extremely reliable. I mean, that's why it's such a good thing to rely on. Um, and so if that's right, we at least need to say a bit more about the sense in which um, the belief needs to be reliably formed because there's one sense in which deduction is perfectly reliable. And reliabilists would want to rely on that fact to explain what's good about deduction and to explain kind of why in other kinds of cases deduction is a very good way of acquiring knowledge. So this makes it seem like reliability might not be enough um, to rule out Gettier cases. It looks like we need to, might need to say a bit, a bit more. Um, and so there's a different kind of tradition at this stage that developed out of kind of independent dissatisfaction with reliabilism that we'll end with, which is virtue epistemology. Um, this can be thought of as another kind of approach that drops the justification condition, but um, retains a kind of true belief plus account and just replaces justification with a further thing, namely being formed by means of an epistemic virtue. And on the A-level syllabus, they say <laughs> that virtue epistemology has the form virtue plus truth plus belief. Now, maybe some versions of virtue epistemology can be represented in that form, but the current version is really not best thought of in that kind of way. And so what I'll now do is just say a bit about the history of virtue epistemology and why I think that's a very misleading way of representing virtue epistemology. So virtue epistemology was first introduced in a 1980 paper by Ernie Sosa called The Raft and the Pyramid. But in that paper, it was really a kind of afterthought. And in that paper, Sosa didn't really think of it as being kind of fundamentally different from reliabilism. In fact, the end of that paper, um, portrays virtue epistemology as just being a new kind of reliabilism. Um, so when it was proposed then, Sosa proposed it as a kind of account 
of what it takes for basic beliefs, like perceptual beliefs, say, to be justified. Um, and to also account for cases like the chicken sexer case, which don't seem best to be described as cases really in which justification or reasons is doing much work to explain how you come to have knowledge. It's really the kind of skill or virtue that you have that's explaining how you have how, how you come to have knowledge. Now in that early presentation of virtue epistemology, we did seem to get a kind of hint that maybe we could analyze knowledge just as true belief plus being uh, produced by an intellectual virtue or being formed through an intellectual virtue. Um, and for the next 15 years or so, virtue epistemology developed in that kind of vein and it received its kind of first ambitious statement in the mid 90s by Linda Zagzebski, um, who developed uh, a kind of virtue epistemology that went beyond just the bare idea of a reliable skill and which instead understood epistemic virtues as um, traits of character that essentially involve having certain good kinds of motivations. So Zagzebski thought that when you come to know that something is true, you exhibit a kind of respect for truth, or she actually used the term love rather than respect. Um, so you show your kind of love of truth or knowledge by forming the belief in a way that's conscientious. Um, and she thought that that captures at least the, the kind of knowledge that we ultimately aspire for, um, knowledge which is formed in a way that is conscientious. Um, and in this way, she kind of distinguished herself from Sosa, who just understood virtues as skills. And so he would have thought the chicken sexer is actually a case of someone whose belief is virtuously formed. Zagzebski, I think, wouldn't really want to say that necessarily um, because it's unclear whether we really want to say that that belief has been formed out of respect or love for truth um, and also whether there is kind of anything more there going on than just the use of a certain skill to arrive at, arrive at the truth. Now, Zagzebski's account ended up not being the most popular version of virtue epistemology because it, it seemed to be too demanding in certain ways, especially when formulated in a way that essentially relies on the notion of love. <laughs> so if you say that in order to know something, you have to manifest love of truth, that just seems to imply that a lot of people actually don't have very much knowledge because many people don't love truth. And even for people who do, do love truth, it's not like they use that all the time. So I love truth. I'm going to go home, though, and take out the garbage and decide what to eat and so on. In doing that, I'm going to rely on a lot of knowledge about where the garbage bins are and what's in my fridge and, and so on. I don't think any of that involves love of truth. I wish it did. I mean, I wish those parts of my life could be philosophy, too but it feels to me like they're pretty different. Like I'm only getting to exhibit my love of truth during the day when I'm, when I'm doing, I mean, during the working day when I'm, when I'm doing philosophy. And so many people thought it just is implausible to understand virtue in that really loaded way. If, if you try to understand knowledge in terms of that kind of intellectual virtue, it turns out that we just don't actually know very much. And that just seems, seems like too strong a thing to say. And so there, there was, after uh, Zagzebski's book in the mid-90s, a turn back to Sosa's version of virtue epistemology. But now there was a key innovation that Sosa made in the 2000s, which involved not simply thinking that when you know you have a true belief and you have a belief that's formed by means of skill, he wanted to add crucially that it has to be that the very accuracy of your belief is itself a manifestation of your skill. And as he pointed out with this famous archery analogy, it does seem conceivable that a person could exhibit skill or use a skill that they have and succeed in the way that that kind of skill is meant 
to bring about, but where the success is not really explained by the skill. And so um, he imagined a case of an archer who's very skilled um, shooting um, at a target on a very windy day. It seems like on a very windy day, you can still exhibit your skill by getting the arrow kind of close <laughs> to the target. So it's not like you're unable to deploy your skill under these conditions. But now imagine that you do take a shot and um, if the winds had remained constant, you would have gotten close, but you wouldn't have quite hit the target. But now imagine that the winds shift um, as the arrow is approaching the target and they lead it right to the bullseye. Can you really take credit for hitting the bullseye in this case? Can you say that that was a manifestation of your skill? It seems like that's the wrong thing to say. It seems like the fact that it hit the bullseye is not due to your skill. It's more due to the fact that there's this lucky gust of wind. And so that's a case in which you succeed um, in achieving what you had wanted to achieve, which is to hit a bullseye. I mean, you succeeded kind of beyond what you had expected to do. And in which you do use your skill, but where the success is not attributable to your skill or not explained by your skill. And then what Sosa wants to say is we can apply that very same idea to the case of epistemology. We can think of uh, belief formation generally as intellectual archery at the mark of truth and say that Gettier cases are cases in which you do uh, manifest intellectual skill and you happen to be right, but where the reason why you're right has nothing to do with the skill that you have. And that kind of account does neatly address Gettier's own cases and the stopped clock case as well. In that kind of case, um, the reason why you end up arriving at a true belief is just by luck. Um, even though in general, this uh, process of trusting clocks that you have is reliable. You tend only to trust clocks that, that do work. Um, and so you do exhibit a kind of virtue. I mean, not a very sophisticated kind of virtue, but some minimal kind of skill. Um, but you still don't have knowledge in that kind of case. So the key thing to say is just that if you look at the most recent work that's been done on epistemic virtue, we shouldn't think of that as offering an analysis of the form true belief plus virtue. It's crucial to add this further because clause. So it has to be that the true belief is formed because of virtue. And that draws the first episode of this series to a close. Please be sure to check out the remaining three episodes as it will come.